Okay, what we want to now go on to is what's called a plasma or Langmuir probe. This is kind of an important thing for understanding uh, edges of plasmas and, and so forth. Uh, so let's talk about a plasma or what is often called a Langmuir probe. Now, the basic idea is, imagine we have a plasma over here with all kinds of positive and negative particles in it. And suppose that we put into it a rod, uh, or probe, as it will be called. And, you know, we'd get collect charge all the way along the rod. So what we do is we say, well, let's put an insulating sheath around it. Okay, so this is an insulator. Um, and then what we do is we say, well, let's connect this up to a, uh, basically an ammeter and a battery to ground. And the question is, how much current do I draw into this circuit depending upon what voltage I apply. So if I, you remember the plasma was supposed to be at a positive potential, rides at a positive potential relative to ground, okay? And so the question is, I may have to go to some fairly positive potential to, uh, well, I, various things will happen, but let's just say as a function of current, what I would like to know is uh, what, uh, as a function of applied bias potential, so we'll plot this as a function of phi, by which we mean phi bias, it turns out. As a function of that bias potential, what actually uh, do we get as, as the current uh, flowing into this external circuit? So the question, let's just say a probe or wire uh, shielded wire, it turns out, is inserted into a plasma. And biased. Uh, the question we want to address is how much current is drawn to the probe as a function of the potential that we apply. Phi equals phi bias potential. Um, now, shouldn't Shouldn't, I guess I shouldn't have those two little dots there because they're inside the insulator, so we'll blotch them out. But uh, um, Now, just roughly speaking, um, what, suppose there were no bias whatsoever. What kind of equilibrium current would we expect could go from the electrons and, to the, and from the ions into the probe? Well, the electron current, J, what I'm going to call J naught E, so this will be the electron current, is equal to uh, N, I'm sorry, E, uh, N, or N naught E, um, times some average thermal velocity. And if you look back, we're kind of liking in this particular case. Uh, that the average thermal velocity is Te over 2 pi uh, times Me. Um, now, by the way, why did I choose an, usually a current, okay, <coughs> is equal to minus for the electrons, is Q is minus E, right? But in this case, what we're looking for is the current uh, into the probe, 
and the electrons, okay, are, by going there, create the, uh, the opposite of such a current. Anyway, by convention, you choose this to be the positive current, uh, whereas for the ions, it, we have the same current except, in the op uh, except with the ion thermal velocity, so it's E n naught I, uh, V thermal I, and so this would be E n naught I square root of T I over 2 pi M E, M I, sorry. Um, now, the potential, does it affect both ions and electrons equally? Well, the answer is generally no. The electrons get manipulated by the potential, and the ions kind of lag behind a good bit. And so, um, let's just say potential really most affects electrons. So what we end up doing is saying then that the electron current is in fact J naught E uh, times E to the E phi over T E. And again, potential has to be measured you know, relative to something, but uh, we'll just leave it in that form. Okay, so now what do we kind of guess will happen as we apply the potential? Um, so what we want is what's called a probe characteristic, which is you plot the current to the probe as a function of potential. And the current to the probe is equal to Je minus Ji. Okay? What if I have a very, very positive potential? Um, well, if I have a positive potential, I'm going to attract all the electrons in sight, right? But all the electrons in sight, in some sense, can, for the most part, except for the fact that I suck them in a little bit, can only get there at, as fast as they can get there with the thermal speed, right? So in some asymptotic sense, I'm going to have some positive, okay, potential out here with a little bit of growth because of acceleration of the, um, because of the potential, but more or less I'm, I'm at some constant value. What about on the, so what about very negative? Well, very negative, first off, uh, I make a very negative potential, and that's how we held back the electrons to maintain a quasi-neutral plasma. So a very negative potential says, Electrons can't get there. But uh, I can only pull in as many ions as I had happening, or, you, you know, getting there with the thermal velocity. And now notice that, the again, the electron thermal velocity is much greater than the ion thermal velocity, square root of the mass ratio 40 times. But the maximum I'll get is roughly this ion current. So if I have a very negative potential. So what we end up with on the ions is then some very small, 40 times smaller current uh, and negative value. What happens in between? Well, what happens in between, you can see by just writing out that J sub E is J naught E, E to the E phi over T E uh, minus J I. And, you know, uh, I really have to have a pretty strong negative potential in order to cut off the electron part here and have that small enough to be with that, right? So the best, uh, so the comment there is that, okay, this just goes through here, and then it sort of asymptotes like this. Um, what potential does that cross over at? Well, it crosses over at exactly the potential where the electron and ion fluxes to the probe are equal. And that's exactly what we calculated before. That was that wall potential. Okay, This is the wall potential, or what is in this context usually called a floating potential. And it's equal to sort of phi wall that we calculated before. <clears throat> 
um, it's a negative value, remember. This current up here, okay, is called the saturation current, which means that it saturates. It's got a little bit of a tilt to it, but very little. So this is the saturation current. Um, or it's often referred to as JSAT, for J is the current. And this would then be the ion saturation current. This is really the electron saturation current. Now, what properties can I use of this probe uh, to tell me various things? Well, let's go back and remember that um, J naught E was basically N E E, N naught E E, V thermal E. So if I know J sat or the saturation current, uh, and I know the electron thermal speed, I could use this magnitude to determine the plasma density. However, how do I get to know the electron temperature? Well, if you look at this curve, you'll note that, and, and remember what's going on here, that the electrons, okay, are going to zero in this range. So basically, this part of the curve is proportional to E to the E phi over TE. So if we plot it out, not at high positive potential, what the, just what the current was, but we came down this curve and went to a negative bias uh, and you know, found the exponential curve on here, we would be able to determine the electron temperature. That turns out to be somewhat complicated to do electronically. So what people often do is they use what's called a double probe. And all that means is you put two probes in the plasma fairly close together within the by length or so uh, in a plasma, within a few Debye lengths of each other, let's just say, uh, in a plasma. And, and then both of them are sitting at the floating potential. Okay, if you just let them ride themselves, they will charge up to, okay, the floating potential, negative in this case. And then what you do is you measure how much current you get as a function of the applied bias between the two probes. And if you do that, what you find is that the current to a double probe, or between the double probes, as a function of phi, has a sort of hyperbolic tangent behavior. And the slope around the origin uh, is proportional. Um, yeah, well. proportional to the electron temperature. Again, for exactly the same reason. So this is just two probes, one and two, and you apply a bias between them and, and measure the, the current. Um, so using this combination uh, of some way or other estimating the electron temperature, you can use the saturation current to then measure um, uh, measure the total saturation current, and then you get uh, some measure of the plasma density. And this is the type of diagnostic that was is used in fairly um, uh, low temperature plasmas like fluorescent lights, um, or um, uh, various types of low temperature edge plasmas, and so forth. Why don't we use it in a hot plasma? Well, these probes can get pretty hot, okay? They're going to take a fair amount of current and a fair amount of beating. And, I mean, you're, you're getting an awful lot of thermal uh, energy into them as you absorb these electrons and ions. I should also mention one other thing which I haven't mentioned which complicates this a bit, um, and that is you get what's called secondary emission. 
Uh, so electrons, when they hit the probe, uh, particularly with a very positive bias, uh, you get extra electrons emitted and then they come back. And so there are additional complications there that can come in occasionally. Um, but let's go on a little bit more. Um, what I was dealing with here was the current density. But when you really measure with an ammeter, you don't measure the current density. You measure amperes, current. Okay? So how much current really flows to the probe? So how much current flows to our, to our Langmuir probe? And by the way, of course, this is lame for Langmuir because Irving Langmuir in the 20s um, uh, worked a lot of this out and used it quite a lot. Um, well, you know, it's just current is equal to some area times the current density to the probe, which we just talked about. What area do I use? Well, you know, I had my little probe over here a minute ago. Uh, well, first off, he's in a plasma. Okay, so I got my plasma here with all kinds of uh, particles in it. And then I had my probe. And then I had my um, insulator on top of that. How big is the area I should put in there? Should put the area of that little tip? Well, if you think about it, remember we had Debye shielding? Okay. What does Debye shielding do? Debye shielding says that if I apply a bias potential to that end of that probe, that potential will be seen, felt, experienced, force, you know, etc., over a distance of the order of the Debye length, right? So it's as if the probe tip, no matter how small I make it, is in fact the same size as the Debye length. So roughly speaking, um, what your area should be is then pi, you know, it's sort of like a cylinder or cylinder here in the plasma's coming along, times the radius of the tip plus the Debye length squared. You know, if the Debye length is smaller than the radius of the tip, I, I still have to take that into account. Um, so the probe will collect a lot more current than you might think if you make yourself an infinitesimal tipped probe, namely that amount within a Debye um, diameter, basically. Uh, although, by the way, I should mention it's pretty hard to make probes quite that small. <laughs> Uh, but in low, temper or low density, fairly high temperature plasmas, you can get fairly large Debye lengths, and so that can be a problem. Um, what about if I had a magnetic field and I put this probe in a magnetized plasma? Well, now I need another color, so let's have a B field that goes along here. And what happens? Well, you know, I have particles gyrating along like this, right? And then they have gyro radii rho. What happens then? Well, roughly speaking, the area is then pi times the tip, let's just say of order, tip plus the by length plus gyro radius. You know. However, that one's trickier because they might miss the probe, okay, because in gyrating they might or might not come precisely where the, the probe is. Uh, but, let's say, can miss the probe. So really more complicated than this. Okay. Uh, anyway, so the basic idea is that... Um, these Langmuir probes are put into plasmas, and if you look at the high potential end or the low potential end, uh, and in particular the transition region, uh, you can get information from the transition region on the electron temperature and from the high end on the um, electron density times square root of electron temperature. Um, and, and these Langmuir probes are used uh, quite often uh, to do uh, various types of diagnostics on a plasma and in particular, 
in addition to um, do fluctuation diagnostics in a plasma, it turns out. Now, before we finish up today, I, I want to just briefly touch on how we would solve our nonlinear equation. Um, so let's do solution and we won't have much time to go into this so uh, nonlinear equation for um, chi is equal to E phi over TE. If you remember our equation it was d squared chi by dx squared is equal to 1 over the divide length squared times e to the chi minus 1 over um, square root of 1 minus. And now uh, it turns out we can write this as 2 chi over m squared um, when we look back uh, where m being the Mach number. Now let's extract from this what it is what form this equation is in. It's in the form d squared f by dx squared is equal to some nonlinear functional g of f, where my f here is equal to the chi, right? Well, that's kind of like, okay, an equation we have lots of fun with. Mass times acceleration is equal to force if the force is in general derivable from a potential, okay? Because this will be mx double dot, or this equation gives us then um, x double dot is equal to minus 1 over mass times d by dx of some potential v of x. So, what we can sort of see is that, you know, mathematically, this equation is actually equivalent to F equals MA for a particle moving in a very complicated potential well. You know, this potential will be actually have to be the integral of that function on the right hand of that function there. Okay. How would we go about figuring out the motion of that particle in a potential well? Well, what we do is we take that equation and we multiply by x dot and we integrate over time. Uh, well, let's multiply by x dot first, let's see. So let's multiply by x dot and what that gives us is one half m dx double dot, I'm sorry, dx dt or x dot squared is equal to you know, x dot times x double dot is just m x double dot squared, x dot squared. And this is then equal to minus, uh, and now I took the mass over, and so then it's dx dt dv dx. But that is just dv dt moving along the orbit. So what this gives us is then uh, the derivative with respect to time of one half m x dot squared plus v of x is equal to zero, or this just gives us that energy is conserved, namely m x dot squared over two plus v of x. The energy is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So how would I solve for x dot out of this? Well, I just do it. X dot is equal to the square root of 2 over mass times energy minus potential of X. Now what I really wanted to know is the equivalent of X as a function of time. So I'd like to integrate that equation. But my equation is dx dt is equal to the square root of 2 over mass times uh, e minus v of x. Um, now, this is just some arbitrary function of x. So call it f1 or something. Uh, so I can put that into the form dt is equal to dx over f of x, which is this 
square root of 2 over mass times e minus v of x. And then I can integrate that from some time to some other time and some spa spatial position to some other spatial position. And what this gives me is that then t is equal to an integral dx divided by the square root of 2 over mass times e minus v of x. So this will give me some g of x. Now, if I look back, what I really wanted to know was x as a function of time. And this gives me the inverse of x as a function of time. It gives me t as a function of x. You know, time along the orbit as a function of where I am. Uh, but I really like, what I'd like to know is I'm at a certain position. How long did it take me to get there, so to speak? So uh, this isn't quite the right way I'd like to solve it. But notice that the procedure I used, if I just redefine the variables, okay, Namely, go back up to this business here, and if I just transform that my core, an analogy with my mechanic with our mechanical analogy here, that x actually goes to chi, so x was the motion here and chi was the potential, and t goes to x, then this equation is f equals m a. It's an unusual use of it uh, brought about by Sagdeyev, it turns out. And we'll talk about using that and this analogous procedure next time so that we can develop how you can actually solve these nonlinear equations in the sense that you reduce a second-order differential equation to a, quote, single quadrature, one integral left to be done. We'll talk about that next time.